for everybody else? Okay, well then, you know, I'll just sort of ban a white thing. How about that? So uh, this is, <clears throat> this is like the volume of commercial paper over time. Okay, so this is like the, um, <clears throat> the number of trades, all right? The number of times where one company lends money to another company, right? Or a bank lends money to another, to a company, right? Does that make sense? And so you can see like here in 2007, 2006, what? oh, June 2007, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's really high up here at whatever that number is, 2.1 trillion, yeah. And then it goes down in September of 07, and then a year later in September of 09, I mean 08, why can't I read? In September of 08, it goes, it drops from 1.78 trillion to 1.55 trillion. So that's like a big drop right there, right? You can see that, right? I mean, all of you can, obviously. I'm not asking you. It's so self centered <laughs> <laughs> So around the same time, right? In fact, so these are, these are like the months of September of 2008, right here. Okay? So in this time frame, <laughs> The, the commercial paper interest rate, right, non-financial corporation, in other words, like companies loaning uh, to, to other companies, right, shot up from 3% to, you know, between 5 and 6%, right? So, I mean, that's crazy, right? I mean, almost doubled the price, right? So, you know, I mean, I don't know what, I pay 100 bucks for these shoes, and all of a sudden, like, two weeks later, they're worth $200, whoa, that's insane, right? Paid a dollar for this bottle of water? Well, Jacob paid a dollar fifty for it, right? Something like that. And then all of a sudden the next day it's three bucks. That's insane, right? Everybody would be like, ah. Right? So these two things make sense happening together, right? The reduction in the volume and the increase in the price. It could be like you have to pay a higher rate for the investor, but a higher rate. They have to have a higher premium because they are more afraid of companies. Okay. So you have to pay them better to get. The okay. Yeah. Yeah. But that's but that's like the reason for the price okay. increase. I'm saying when the quantity goes down and the price goes up at the same time. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, it sounds like. What does it sound like? Price goes up. Quantity goes down. Oh, uh, uh, that's a supply shift, right? Yeah, it's it's a movement along the demand curve, which is a shift of the supply curve, right? We're shifting the supply curve to the left or up, right? We're increasing the opportunity cost of lending, right? <clears throat> so then, what happens after that? Well, by the end of 2008. So this is, again, this is the price, right? So we see this big price run up in September of 08, and it stays high until the end of the year. And then, boom, it drops even lower than it had started, right? It was originally at three, goes way up to six, and then comes all the way back down to two, and goes even lower than that in 2009. <clears throat> and we also get a big drop off in the amount of lending, right? Like we showed here. Right? After that period, even farther down. So we had a supply curve shift to the left, right? Which caused the price to go way up and the quantity of trades to shift down, right? To go down. And then the price shifted again. Because now, in response to the supply curve shifting to the left, the demand curve shifted to the left. Does that make sense? So I think I can show it with my other graph here. I'm not really going to need to turn the light on. No, I guess I'm not. You can still see that, can you? Looking at you, POV. 
And I'm recording this out there. So. Uh, so <laughs> Hi, Russ. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, can y'all see this at all? Yeah. No. I'm just getting old. I can barely read it from here. So what happens here is okay, I like that. So this is before September of 2008. Right? We're just sort of trucking along in the commercial paper market. Right? Rates are staying pretty much the same. Prices are pretty stable. Right? In other words, the interest rate is the price in this case. Right? So we're not talking about interest rates as a demand shifter anymore. Right? We're talking about the price being the interest rate. Okay, this is right. That's so hard to fall asleep. My own lecture is boring. <laughs> so then in 2008, right, in September of 2008, all of a sudden now, the cost of lending shoots up, right? Marginal cost curve shifts up, right? So that means the supply curve shifts up, right? So what happens to the price? Well, the price goes up, right? And the quantity goes down. You get a reduction in the quantity, right? And so now, if you're on the borrowing side, right, if you're the borrower in this market, right, in other words, you're on this side, man, you see that price go way up, you're like, I can't afford to borrow hardly anything now, right? And you're like, well, maybe it's a bad sign if I'm borrowing, right? Maybe it looks bad to me as a company, right? So I need to change my valuation of borrowing. Right? I need to change the way I'm thinking about it. Right? Maybe my investors won't like it so much if I'm borrowing in the commercial paper market now. Right? Does that make sense? So we've got a change in the mentality of the buyer. What does that mean for the demand curve? It means we've got to shift it, right? Well, it means we've got to shift it, correct, to the left. Do it. So now we've got our new supply curve. Oh, wait. <coughs> I don't like that one. That's an ugly supply curve. I mean, an anchor. There's on your demand curve, way over there, right? So now our rates are low, and we've got an even lower quantity, right? Now the price fell and the quantity fell. In other words, sort of the market kind of fell apart, hello, right? Bad news. Make sense? Who was in the commercial paper market? And lost their shirt back in 08. Anybody? Nobody in this room. That's good. Proud of you. Good job, Jason. I knew you were a good investor back in 08. I knew you saw it coming. That's not even funny. The age stuff just gets non funny after a while, right? Okay. We can just make fun of boomers from now on. How about that? You don't make fun of boomers now? All right. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, another application of equilibrium here. <clears throat> um, and we're going to talk about um, supply and demand curves and um, talking about transactions and specifically kind of how we move around these equilibrium points. And so let's say we've got just one person. Um, basically deciding how the supply side and the demand side of the markets interact. Okay? 
that one person is making that decision, right? So the way this is, this is sort of an analogy to like a stock market, okay? Right, where there's kind of like a central decider of the transactions, right? And so to make those transactions, right, someone has to actually take the stock, the ownership in a company from one person and give it to another person, right? But of course, they're not gonna do it for free, right? Are you gonna do it for free? No way, neither am I, right? So when we buy the stock from this person, we might offer them a little bit less, right? And then when we sell it to the other person, we might charge a little bit more, right? Just to sort of, you know, keep our wallets live, right? You wanna learn more about this? Sit in on my futures and options class this fall. 1 p.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. See you there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So when we talk about this difference in the price that I charge, excuse me, I'm getting the stock from the seller, right? So I'm going to pay them a little bit less and I'm going to sell it for a little bit more, right? As the person in the middle, right? So we have something called the bid ask spread, okay? And so the bid, we wanna have the bid lower, right? Because we're gonna pay that seller a little bit less, right? So we're paying the seller the bid price. And when we sell it to the buyer, the ask, we're gonna push that up a little bit, right? So you can see up here at the top, if we're gonna have five trades, then our bid ask spread is going to be a big goose egg, right? A big nut. You guys can't see that, but I'll explain that, okay? So we're not going to make any profit when we're going to allow five trades to go through, right? But if we shrink the market down a little bit, and we only allow four trades through, now all of a sudden we're paying the seller seven and we're getting nine from the buyer, right? Does that make sense? Because we're the one in the middle. So what's our profit in that case? Two bucks, right? So then we show here um, at quantities of three and two, we end up with a profit of 12. Because when we allow three transactions, we're paying the seller six bucks and we're asking $10 from the buyer, right? Does that make sense? So three transactions, four bucks, that's $12 profit, right? So the question is, how many transactions do we let through if we're the ones deciding the market? Well, we let two or three go through, right? Because in either case, we're gonna make 12 bucks. Does that make sense? So that spread, that 12 bucks, in the case of allowing two or three transactions through, that's kind of the profit that we get, right? That's an economic profit. Well, assuming we can pay the cost of the transaction fees, right? Because, you know, it actually does cost us something to make those transactions happen, right? In theory. We're the ones kind of putting everybody in the same room. Right? Maybe we offer them some, you know, meats and cheeses. I don't know, right? But we facilitate the transaction, right? So we need something to cover our costs, right? So if now all of a sudden, now we're in a competitive market for those brokerage services, right? Now all of a sudden there's more than one market maker, right? Does that make sense? More than one person making that market now. How's that gonna work? And let's say cost is $2 per trade. What do you think the bid ask spread is gonna be? 
Sorry? Well, so the key words here are competitive market, right? And the cost is two bucks. So what happens in a competitive market? Right, okay, so they, they decide they want to buy from one person and not the other, right? So what is that, what happens to economic profit in a competitive market? Right, so economic profit becomes zero, right? All right, so adjusting for the risk, adjusting for the cost and all that stuff, we make no economic profit, right? But there's a legitimate cost to making this market, which is two dollars, right? I say legitimate. There's a there's an economic cost of two dollars to make a market, right? So if that's the case, how many transactions am I going to have? Or, well, what's the bid ask spread going to be? Two dollars, right? Because we said zero economic profit, right? My economic costs are two dollars. So what does my revenue have to be if I'm going to make zero profit and the cost is two? Two, right? Two dollars of revenue minus two dollars of cost is zero profit, right? There, I saw Jacob get it. Okay. I thought it was asking, like, in context of, like, the chart, like, well, yeah, the bid ask spread is going to be two dollars. The bid is going to be seven, and the ask is going to be nine. Oh, okay, okay. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I got you. So, in a competitive market, we're actually going to get more transactions, right? It's going to be optimal to have more transactions in this case, right? Okay. I don't know what that's. Uh, let's see. Okay, so if you didn't think that was fun, just wait till we get to this. Let's see. Okay. 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 So we are no longer in the upside down Stranger Things fans. I heard you say. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Okay, maybe we lied to you because the angle on there is the exact same angle that they have. So I think this is just what records it for him, like to put on YouTube. There's a small screen to show us that one. That's what I'm saying. I, line, right? Like when you're looking at it online, you can see like the fucking screen so they can like pick, choose to walk. Yeah. The point is that screen has a better shot at this. Right. Can you can y'all see that better? Really? Seriously? Or do I need to move it? Should I move it closer? Yeah. No? Okay, so that might Should I move I should not move it closer. No. Okay. I'm gonna take your yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe I should I turn the light off, do you think? I don't know. Yeah, because that'll help too much light right there. Why can't I like select and turn off lights? Hey. That help? That help internet people? It didn't change really. It didn't change. Yeah, yeah, I don't want Jason falling asleep. Yeah, it's whoever's talking, but if that one connected to me, that's. Well, we'll okay. almost need to focus the camera. Oh, focus the camera. Yeah. That's beyond my level of faith in this whole laptop. Sorry. Well, let's just move in. You might want to plug it back in. Too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it not plugged in? All right, just plug oh, it back. Yeah, yeah plug it back in. in. Just for the different. Yeah, it's singing. Yeah. Lots of angles. I like it. it. Makes it look grand, like Star Wars thing. All right. Uh, let's see. <coughs> hmm. I don't know. I'm not sure I'm on board with that one right there. Um. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so. 
we're going to talk a little bit about kind of long run uh, changes in markets that tend to kind of shift um, the conditions such that like companies that were successful now might not be companies that were not as successful become more successful, right? Um, and so <clears throat> if, if have y'all talked about like perfect competition or competitive firms, we talk about that yet. Okay. So competitive firm is one that can't affect the price. Okay. So they're, they're going to try, if they try to charge a higher price, then everybody is going to automatically stop buying from them and start buying from someone else, from one of their competitors. Does that make sense? So that means they're, they're what we call a price taker. Okay. They can't affect the price, right? All they can do is just sell at the market price. And if, you know, they try to raise it, then someone's going to, you know, go to someone else. Right. So, Everyone is going to sort of make the same uh, economic profit, which is going to be zero, right? So um, <clears throat> there's a lot of <clears throat> they either have the product is the same or all the products are roughly the same, right? They're very close substitutes with each other, right? Um, and so <clears throat> there's no uh, cost advantage over some other firm, right? They roughly have the same cost structures, right? So if they produce five units, it costs them the same as another firm if that other firm produces five units, right? Um, <clears throat> there's no barriers to entry or exit in the industry. In other words, um, it's sort of, if you, uh, if you want to get into the industry, it doesn't cost you much. And getting out of the industry doesn't cost you anything either, right? So, like, imagine that, um, excuse me, you want to enter the industry, let's say you have to buy some equipment or a factory or something like that, right? So, when you buy in, everyone else kind of can purchase that same um, asset that gets them into the industry at the same price as you, and they all have the same access to it. Right. And then when you leave the industry, you don't lose any money when you sell that asset. Right. Does that make sense? Now, I mean, you know, it'd be hard to figure out how that would actually happen. Right. Um, like, let's say you ran a pizza hut in 1995 and then it went belly up. Right. So you sold the building. How many people are going to want to buy a pizza hut building? From you? Right. What do those things look like? I know I built them. Sorry. Building. Yeah, the Vive Broadband building right over there on 15th Street, 15th and Main, is an old pizza hut, right? And you can tell it's like this. It's got like big wood shingles on it or something. Yeah, right. They got like a, yeah, they got like a, uh, like prison bars or something. Um, <clears throat> so there's all these restrictions on the industry itself, but then, you know, each firm um, chooses the profit maximizing quantity. Because they can't check, they can't affect the price, right? So they can't they can't sell more than another firm, right? Because all the products are the same, right? The products are all the same, and their production technologies are all the same, right? So they don't have any advantages. Um, <clears throat> they can sell all they want at the competitive price, um, but you know their their marginal revenue is equal to the price. So the the amount of money that they get in addition to, um, you know, the amount of money that they get from selling that product is always equal to the price, right? It's not, there's not some kind of an advantage, right, for them selling in that market because other people can just come in. So, <clears throat> so if we're at a point on the production function where the price is above the marginal cost, we just produce more, right? And once we get to the point where price is equal to marginal cost, Right, we talked about that, didn't you? Price equals marginal cost. If we get past the point where price equals marginal cost, right? In other words, the price is below marginal cost, then we just produce less, right? So things are pretty simple. <clears throat> so in the short run, a firm can earn um, 
an economic profit. Um, and, and the way that would happen is that, you know, that firm might um, have some kind of short-term advantage that they build over another company in the same industry, right? So, um, let's see. So think of an example for this. Um, <clears throat> who was the first company to come up with a device that looks like this? Anybody know? <clears throat> first one that looked like this? In other words, like there's no buttons on, the, there's no like physical buttons on it anywhere. Right, it's got a camera back here. I would say Apple thought that was Yeah. Oh. In fact, it looks a lot. It looked a lot like that little thing that's sitting right there, right? First iPhone looked a lot like that, right? So, I mean, heck, if they were able to, you know, kind of convince people that their phones were pretty cool, right? In the short run, they might have made some economic profit, right? But then what happened a couple of years later? Right. So somebody else decided to make these things, right? And in fact, Google kind of had the same strategy that Microsoft had in the example we were talking about earlier tonight, right? They just started saying, hey, everybody can put Android on all their phones, right? And so everybody but Apple did. Well, and Microsoft, but forget about that, right? Who cares? All right, Android said, look, here's our app market, right? Here's our operating system. Samsung can use it, LG can use it, Google's gonna use it, right? This is Pixel 3, right? So, Apple did okay for a while, right? They killed BlackBerry effectively, right? It's dead. But in the long run, you know, Samsung, right? No, they'll sell you a thousand dollar phone just like Apple will, right? So <clears throat> in the long run, positive profit, right? So that positive profit that Apple was making, that leads to other firms coming into the industry. Right? Now all of a sudden, Samsung wants to make a phone like that. LG wants to make a phone like that. Right? I don't know the other one. Um, so that, well, maybe it decreases the price. Probably. Right? At the beginning, right, those phones probably got cheaper. And then they got crazy more expensive. Right? But on average, right, you can go get like a normal, just a basic smartphone for like 150 bucks. Right? 200 bucks maybe. Right, and but at the beginning, right back in, I don't know, 2010, 12, something like that. I mean, smartphones were insane, right? Not like they are now, but those are like you know, super high end devices, right? <clears throat> so that positive profit led other companies into the industry, and that short run positive economic profit that Apple was making on their fancy new phone design, gone, right? Or not gone completely, but you know. Because now there's like, what, a handful of firms in the industry that do it? Negative profit leads to exit, right? So if you think about a declining industry, right? What kind of declining industry? What, what industry can you think of that's on the decline right now? Taxis. Taxis. Okay. So the service of what? Well, okay, so <laughs> this one's really complicated, right? So taxis were making probably really big profits, right? Because they had a barrier to entry, right? You ever heard of a taxi medallion, right? You had to buy this right to operate a taxi in a city, right? From the city itself, from the government, right? And these things cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, okay? So it's this whole license to operate a taxi, right? And so those people made tons of money because they were able to restrict the number of people who could drive people around, right? Well, then what? So, the, so they were in this point right here, right? Positive profit. Then what? Competitors come in, right? Uber, right? Lyft, okay. And so now it kind of went worse. Right now, they kind of separated those two markets, right? It's, yeah, okay, it's driving people around, right? But one of them is a taxi, and the other one is just, you know, somebody's car, right? And it's real convenient. It's on your phone. Pop, 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 boom, they're there, right? And so now, those taxi companies, all of a sudden, now they have all these assets that aren't producing anything, right? You ever watch the old show Taxi? 
right? Because no one they didn't read or something like that. Right? They had like you know phones and they had like people that they employed to take phone calls and then CB radios that called out, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Right? You're gonna lose money on all that. <laughs> yeah, right. You're like, what's a CB radio? So <laughs> just see the classes are getting younger and younger. Yeah, it's not going to get any better for me. <clears throat> so the point is that there's this, what we call mean reversion of profits, right? So profits, yeah, early on at the beginning of that industry, right, when everything's brand new, right, Apple just came out with a smartphone, boom, look at that, they're making 40% return on investment, right? And then over time, competitors come in, right? We start driving that return down until it's just kind of a small amount, right? Does that make sense? <clears throat> and then the same thing happens too. That so, if we're thinking about maybe two different industries, right, where this industry is making really high profits and this one's making lower profits, right? So as this one starts, the, re the returns start to fall in this industry. <clears throat> what do you think investors are going to start doing with their money while they're in this industry? Right, they're going to start taking some of their winnings, right? And they're going to start investing in other industries, right? And in fact, maybe they would actually even shift their investment, right? They would actually disinvest from one industry and invest in another that's on the other one, right? And so then, uh, over time, all the industries across the board Right? Start coming together in terms of the rate of return that they can, that they're offering. Right? Does that make sense why you would do that? So, we have this idea that <clears throat> assets can move around, right? So if, um, if you can take your money out of one stock in the stock market and put it in another one very easily, right? In other words, if, if it doesn't cost much to move your investment around, right? Then you're going to tend to move it around to the point where those assets get put to a more productive use, right? Does that make sense? Because when one industry starts losing money, okay, well, they're going to have to shrink their industry down, right? And we as investors are going to move our money out of that industry and put it into another one that needs to expand, right? So, but I, I like this example here of San Diego and Nashville. If, if San Diego is a better place for you to locate your business than Nashville, then what's going to happen over time? Say what? Yeah. All the country musicians are going to leave Nashville and start singing songs about San Diego. Right? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Right? So if if San Diego is a better place for us to um, to put our money, then we'll we'll figure out a way to move our assets from one to the other, and, and so we don't really care about San Diego or Nashville in and of themselves, right? What we care about is sort of the traits that San Diego offers in terms of being an attractive place to do business, right? Does that make sense? Another way to think about this is to think about wage, compensating differentials in wages. So <clears throat> there's all kinds of fun, yeah, that's a bird. Uh, there's all kinds of fun uh, ways to talk about compensating differentials. And I think, I think this is, makes a little more uh, sense, and maybe a little bit more um, on the ground um, and, and intuitive than the last one. But <clears throat> so, have you ever thought about why some industries pay better than others? Or maybe maybe just why one job pays better than another, right? So how do you how do you get a raise at a company? Anybody know? 
You do good. Wow. Very specific answer there. Work hard. Work hard. Okay. I smile every day. You make the company more money. You make the company more money. Okay. How do you do that? It's about working hard with a smile every day. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to give you a raise for smiling. Sorry. I'm really not. Well, I mean, you know, sometimes I'm going to say stuff like work smart, not hard, right? You know, don't carry the 100 pound sacks, put them on the forklift, right? What else? Like, okay, well, here, let me help you out. Do managers make more money than. Make managers at Sonic make more money than the people making cheeseburgers? Yes. Yeah. Why? They're a bigger asset. More skilled. They're a bigger asset. They're more skilled. Okay. Yeah. Right. So the managers might have some experience under their belt. Right? And the thing that they do actually requires more skill sets. Right? Or it requires them to understand things better. Right? So their experience, whatever. Right, now they know how not not only do they know how to make cheeseburgers, but they also know how to manage people who make cheeseburgers, right? They know how to motivate people. But there's another thing too, right? You think it's fun to manage a bunch of teenagers making cheeseburgers? How many of you want to sign up for that job? <clears throat> it's kind of a pain in the neck, right? Probably. So if it's a pain in the neck, more of a pain in the neck, probably going to be asking for a little more money for it, right? We want to promote you to manager. Oh, great. That sounds like a giant pain in the neck. Oh, we'll pay you. Oh, okay. That's right? So here's an example. Why do embalmers make more than rehabilitation counselors? <laughs> What's an embalmer? Anybody know? If you pass away, the person who kind of takes over the body. Yeah, the person who kind of prepares a dead body for burial, right? Mort uh, yeah, mortician. mortician. There you go. Yeah, like mortician on the abdomen, right? What's a rehabilitation counselor? Maybe you've gone through a trauma. Rehab, yeah, that's the. Right. So, you know, one of these is maybe a little more pleasant than the other one. Who wants to be an embalmer, right? Really? Well, what if we pay you like minimum wage? Right, you want to make a lot of money for it, right? But here you've seen that show, uh, Dirty Jobs, the micro guy. All of those people make tons of money, right? All those people, those horrible jobs, because they have to pay them money to do those horrible jobs, right? Well, I say tons of money, skill adjusted too. There's a skill adjustment in there too. <clears throat> so this compensating wage differential basically says, we'll pay you more for doing a job that nobody wants to do, right? Or on the other side of it, where's a place everybody wants to live? Who needs it? Okay. Probably not supported by uh, recent, you know, <laughs> Data that's showing access to this, but that's okay. Okay, California. Like what city? Where? I was going to say, I don't know, probably. Calabasas. San Diego. San Diego? Okay, yeah. You know, it's it's not hot there all the time, right? It's kind of nice. You know, that's where they film Top Gun, which is kind of cool. See what's going on? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I'm going to want it. So, if I offer you a job in San Diego, right, and let's just say the cost of living in San Diego is the same as everywhere else, right? If I offer you the same job in Kansas City or San Diego at the same wage, which place are you going to pick? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <The> wrong route. <laughs> okay, uh, if I offer you a job in Jackson, Mississippi or San Diego, which place are you going? Right, so maybe what if I gave you what if I paid you less? You still maybe go to San Diego? No, because the cost of living is so high. Yeah, well, okay, but I'm saying the cost of living is the same. Forget oh, about that. Yeah. Sorry. No, the point is no, that's okay. The point is some people would actually take less money 
to live in a place that's nicer, right? So that's a compensating differential for the location, right? What other examples can you think of? Compensating wage differentials. Underwater welders, right? So why why would you why would I need to pay you a lot to do that? This is dangerous. Doesn't sound dangerous. How? Yeah, it's not. Yeah, put me in seawater and then put an electrical field around me. That's not the most scary. Let me know really how that works. Anybody ever had had a job with a wage compensating wage differential on it? I mean, we even have words for this, right? Hazard pay. You ever heard of that? There you go. You've never had a job with a compensating wage differential? Nobody? Really? Sounds like have you? Yeah, I think I have. No, I really do. I think I have. I mean, you just have to think about it, right? So, like, how many people like car sales? Very few, right? You can make a lot of money with a high school education selling cars. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah I got it. Yeah, that's a compensating wage differential, right? No one likes you, right? Everybody thinks you're a dishonest jerk. But hey, you may get 120K with a high school education, right? What about, well, I mean, hazard pay. Yeah, when, I was, when, I was, when I was in high school, I worked at a lumber yard and I had to wear, you know, steel toed boots and a hard hat and I was outside in the cold and the heat, right? And I got paid a lot more than my friends did. So, like, a cleaning, like a maid, would that be like something like, no one wants to be a maid, but like some days, like, right? So, yeah, so there's a lot of other things that would go into the actual pay they would get, right? So, like, if there's a lot of people offering those types of services, right, then we would get into a position where there was there was a ton of competition for those jobs, and that might actually drive the wage. That might push down that, compensate, that wage differential, right, that compensating differential, because some people just, they're not worried about the stuff that makes that job terrible, right? But, yeah, yeah, some of those people make a lot of money. One. It'd be like the opposite where we're like, let's say, I don't know, like right now, like a lot of Hispanics are maybe coming up here and they just want to work here. So they'll, so basically you could pay them like almost next to nothing, but they'll take it because it's a lot worse, than, or a lot better than what they would Yeah, like so I, right. So what I think part of what has to go into that is a kind of a discussion about the market itself. So like part of what makes that different is the fact that in a lot of cases, it's not legal to employ them. Right, and so like from the employer's perspective, for them to take on the risk of employing someone where it's illegal, they'll they pay less because they have to deal with that risk, right? Or like to get a lower cost, they'll go outside of a sort of open market, right? Where you can kind of do whatever you want, right? So yeah, I mean that's a good example. There's just the, the, the compensating differentials are a little bit yeah a little bit different, yes. But yeah, that's a good point, right? So. You're just really desperate for the job, right? And so one way you could think about that is like if the place you're going to in the U.S. is much better, right, then you're willing to put up with a lower wage because the condition where you came from is really bad, right? So, I mean, you could frame it that way, too. Nobody's had a job with a compensating wage difference. Like working on a farm where you get bonuses if you uh, do the main things and things like that and those people things. Oh yeah, there you go. Right, so maybe compensated differentials within that job, right? Good point. So if they, so this is more the hazard pay thing, right? It's like here's your normal job. If you do a little extra, take out a little bit more risk, something a little more dangerous, we'll give you a little more money. Right. So here's so how many of you had a job when you were like 16? Anybody online? Yeah. Some of you, yeah. So here's the thing, and, and I was too. Okay. You've all had a job with a compensating differential, right? The employer took a risk on a 16-year-old, right? <laughs> so they paid you less because you're 16 and you're paying the neck, right? That's compensating differential. It's just sort of the opposite direction, right? I wasn't paying the neck when I was 16, believe me. 
on purpose. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> those are good examples. I like those. Uh, let's see. So another way to kind of apply this same this same sort of principle from our compensating wage differential is to think about risk and return in finance, right? So um, <clears throat> later this fall, when some of you take my class and maybe others will take it next year. Um, we will talk a lot about kind of the reasons why we have interest rates, right? Or the reason why people might invest money in a business that is brand new and unproven, right? And we'll talk about risk as one reason why, you know, people want a higher return. They expect a higher return out of these businesses, right? So I'm taking on more risk with my investment. I'll only, you know, I'll only invest if you're gonna, if there's sort of a better chance of me getting a higher return, right? <clears throat> so in equilibrium, right? So we talked about equilibrium, like if we've kind of dealt with all of the you know, competitive issues in a market, right? And everybody can sort of move their capital around, right, their money, their investments into wherever they want to put them, right? Based on all the other factors, right? Like everybody knows what's gonna happen in the future to all these different markets and all this sort of stuff, right? And the only thing that's left over is just the risk in that industry, right? Then, the rate of return that we earn on those investments is going to only reflect nothing but the risk differentials between different industries, right? So can you think of an industry that has, um, that offers higher returns, but is also riskier in terms of where you would invest your money? Real estate. Okay, real estate. Yeah, I see you think like maybe something like 10 years ago, something really bad happened to all the real estate in the entire country, right? Remember that? Nice. Okay, so real estate in general or any specific kind of real estate? What do you think? Okay, so. Real estate relative to the debt market for, you know, very stable companies. I'm sure like right? real estate too, yeah, there's some. Okay. Yeah, you could go either way, right? Like maybe um, <clears throat> corporate real estate, like, or sorry, uh, commercial real estate maybe is more or less risky than single family homes, right? Maybe there's differences in the risk for those. And so when you invest in those different types of, Assets, right? If you if you invest in a company that builds single-family homes versus a company that builds or lends money for commercial real estate, right, you're going to offer you're going to get a different rate of return, right? What about if you're a bank and you're lending money for? Hmm, well, no, no, let's not do that. Well, yeah, let's do that. You're lending money to for for car loans, right? And one person is 50 years old and they're borrowing, uh, the, the amount of money that they're borrowing for a car is only 50% of the value of the car, right? I have a stable job, a credit score, right? And the other person you're gonna lend money to to buy a car, is a teenager with a job at Sonic, and they're borrowing 90% of the cost of the car. You're going to charge them the same interest rate. 
What do you think? Probably not, right? You're going to charge the first person a lot less, right? Because they don't present nearly as much of a risk to you as the other person does, right? Make sense? I mean, you can kind of think about insurance too, right? When I was in high school, I had like a 10 year old car, but because it only had two doors and it had a V8, I paid $110 a month for, it, for insurance. When I saw it. And you're near that now. I don't pay even anywhere close to that. Now I'm old. Does this make sense? So why would you invest in like a really big company that had a really low rate of return? Like Coca-Cola or something. It's safe. This is really safe, right? So it's just the opposite. All right, so it kind of operates like a compensating differential does for wages, right? The interest rate compensates for the risk. Your wage compensates for, you know, how um, <clears throat> how dangerous the job is. So we kind of already talked about this a little bit, but um, we want to kind of we talk about competitive firms where um, you know in this competitive industry, all the products are roughly the same, right? All the businesses have the same sort of cost structure, right? And you know, from the from the consumer's perspective, everything is the same about the products they produce, and there's not really anything they can do to earn positive economic profits, right? There's still, you know, price is equal to marginal cost, but in a competitive market, that's gonna, not going to result in the economic profit. But in a monopoly situation, if there's one firm then um, <clears throat> basically what's going to happen there is that they are going to be able to earn economic profits um, at least for a while because they face this downward sloping demand curve, right? So on a perfectly competitive market, the demand curve is, is um, horizontal, right? Because again, any, anybody tries to charge above the market price, right? They don't sell anything, right? Does that make sense? So, in the case of a downward sloping demand curve, though, that's not the case, right? We reduce, we increase the price a little bit. We're not going to, we're not going to sell nothing. We're just going to sell a little bit less, right? Does that make sense? I guess the difference would be, right, is that in the long run, those monopolies can't always last, right? Yeah, sometimes, you know, companies can last for a really, really long period of time, right? But if, if it's possible for other firms to create substitutes to the products that that firm makes, right, then eventually their profits are going to be competed away, right? In other words, that downward sloping demand curve it's going to flatten out, right? Does that make sense? So an example with <coughs> old computers, but <coughs> you know, this is the same story with the phone, right? Got the iPhone and then <coughs> They're not the only game in town after a couple of years, right? And they get their advantage either way. So let's see. Um, I want to move to 10 now. And what time does the class usually let out? 10 to 10. Yeah. Plenty of time. It's not funny. Okay. <clears throat> 
so here's here's where I want to bring in I think more of the kind of um, the more of the kind of business and um, sort of management strategy stuff and sort of contrast it with the way that the economics um, world kind of thinks about how um, firms act in markets. Uh, and so what we're what we're going to talk about is sustainable competitive advantage. And so I I'm just going to kind of go on my own with this I think instead of really worry much about the notes. Um, <coughs> So the idea is that um, you, a competitive advantage is something that allows your business to earn economic profits. Okay? So from, a, from, a, from an econ perspective, that's how this sort of thing works. Okay? Is we, there's something about our product that's different, or there's something about our firm that's different that allows us to earn an economic profit. Right? Does that make sense? So we're able to we're able to earn you know more than you know in a competitive market we really could right we we're not facing that horizontal demand curve right there's something about our product or something about our firm that gives us an advantage <coughs> and so um, <clears throat> we you know. Our stock price, right, so the, the, the value of the company, and this is again something I'm going to cover uh, in the fall, with all of you, is the stock price that, your, that reflects the value of your company is, in a way, based on the future profits that company is going to earn, right? And so we call this discounted cash flow analysis. Um, and we talk about time value of money and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> And so, you know, if, if the, the consumer, the, the total value that a consumer is willing to pay for a product is $400, okay, but the market price is only $300, right, then the consumer is going to make, is going to get some kind of surplus, right? In other words, they want to complete that transaction because they're getting something more out of it, right? The, the thing they're buying is worth more than the money that they're giving them. Right? So they're only giving 300, but the thing they're buying is worth 400 to them. Right? Does that make sense? But what's important for the firm is this second part here, right? Profit. The difference between the price and the cost. Right? And so, you know, as a, as a firm, we're, you know, okay, fine if people want to have some consumer surplus, but we're worried about this part, right? This is how we attract investors, right? This is how we push the stock market, the, the stock price up, right? This is how we earn a return for our investors, right? We gotta have that. <clears throat> so there's there's kind of two different ways of thinking about this, but I think there's there's a little bit more that I want to um, talk about as we go through this. So. Um, there's sort of the economic view, right? I mean, your out says economics, right? Industrial organization is a whole field of economics that tries to understand firm behavior, okay? And so, um, you know, here, within each industry, um, you know, we're just going to try to characterize the, the, the competition in that industry. And then our investment choice is basically gonna come down to, you know, pick the right industry, right? If we want to build a business in an industry, or if we want to build a successful business, we have to pick the right industry, right? That's what IO is going to tell us, right? Pick an industry where, you know, capital is going to be flowing into that industry, right? Where it's going to be able to increase the ROI, right? Well, the resource-based view says build the right firm, right? So it's not about the industry itself, it's about what you are able to do as a business, right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. And so um, when we when we talk about this IO view, we have something called Porter's five forces. Yeah. Um, so I talk about this in one of my undergrad classes quite a bit, but this is just kind of basic strategy and just basic business strategy stuff. Um, and Porter's five forces, really Porter was a, or is a, a 
business school guy, but this kind of fits into the I.O. Uh, framework. So you want to find an industry that has high barriers to entry, right, or exit, okay? In other words, you want to make it costly for people to get into your industry, right? Does that make sense? You want to make you want to make you want to maybe find an industry that has like licenses, right? Like the medical industry, right? Where there's government licenses that keep the quantity of doctors lower, right? Puts a higher hurdle for them to jump over to get in. <clears throat> Low buyer power, right? So the specific spot that you serve in an industry, right? Let's pick. Um, Do you think an industry that has low buyer power? In other words, the buyers don't have it would be prescription medicine. Right? So an industry where the buyer doesn't have much of a negotiating position. Right? So okay, prescription medication, that's a good one. Right? So there's lots of customers, right? They don't know much about the product, right? And they're not really in a position to negotiate because really there's only a handful of firms that dispense that product, right? Ultimately, right? I mean, yeah, you can go to Walgreens or you know, Price Chopper, but they're gonna give you the same price, right? Okay? So good industry to get into if you can, right? But probably have pretty high barriers to answer for Low threat, or excuse me, low supplier power. Think about supplier power. You think about Walmart. You think Walmart is in a position where its suppliers have a lot of control over their business model? <laughs> no way, right? In fact, they're in such a good position, right? Their suppliers have such low power that they're able to basically dictate the supplier's supply chain for them, right? You have to be able to produce X and so amount and put it in thus and so stores right, the way Walmart dictates, right? So their suppliers don't have a lot of power. <clears throat> Low threat from substitutes, right? The main thing there is have a product that is, um, you know, highly protected from other, other things, um, you know, taking it over, right? So pens wouldn't be a great one, right? Because everybody can just go buy a pencil. Right? Are a lot of them protected by like regulation? Like, I think they're like, like power companies and stuff. It's like, I think it's only the only five of the US stock. Right. Yeah. Sure. So you can have it to where there's a high barrier to entry from a license, or you can flat out have, have it where you have a monopoly, a legal monopoly on the, the, the supply of a product that there is no substitute for electricity in general, right? How are you going to do it, right? So you're going to build a parallel grid, right? No, nobody's going to do that, right? Low levels of rivalry between existing firms, okay? And then, you know, so that's uh, so that's the fifth one, right? In this list of five, but actually six. Low levels of rivalry between existing firms. So, is there a lot of rivalry between? What do you think, Coca-Cola and Pepsi? So, right? So you don't want to get into a firm where everybody's like fighting each other on price, right? Everybody's offering the best, trying to offer the best sale they can, right? Or something like that. And advertising aggressively, right? This is going to cost you a lot of money because you're going to have to advertise aggressively, right? You're going to have to have rock bottom prices, right? And so you don't want to get into that mess, right? You want to get into an industry where everybody kind of just handles their own thing, right? And in a lot of cases, this is then hyper-regulated industries like power, right? <clears throat> and then the sixth one that you know we say Porter forgot about, cooperation from complementary products. Right? So you want to find an industry where the other products that go with your the products you're producing. 
right? that you can cooperate with other firms. And so the point is, you know, find this good industry that um, uh, can, can do well for you and, and, and operate in that industry. The point is you analyze the industry itself. You don't try to build a firm that makes sense. We kind of went through all these actually. So is there any evidence for this idea that, you know, picking one industry versus another makes any sense? Right? Well, one way to think about that is to say, do different industries earn different levels of profit on average across different industries? Right? So if the point is, if, if, if the only, um, if the only difference um, in sort of average profit was between individual firms, right? Then all these industries would sort of have the same rate of return, right? And there would just be firms within the industries that were like really crappy or really good, right? But on average, they'd be pretty close. But they're not, right? So, you know, pharmaceuticals, right? That was one of the things we talked about, right? Super high barriers to entry, very low buyer power, right? Very low, I mean, you know, what's a substitute for, you know, blood pressure medication, right? You know. <laughs> well, you know, not eating any good food, I guess, you know. No sodium. Whatever. <laughs> but here on the other end, right, motor vehicles, right? We got worldwide competition. Every market is just flooded with competitors, right, these days, right? You got Korea, Japan, depending on where you live, China, right? US, Europe, all making cars, right? So lower rates of return there because there's tons of rivalry, right, between the different companies, right? I, when I sold cars in 2007, uh, when I was in college, I worked at a, a one dealership that had Honda on one side and Toyota on the other. And both companies hated that dealership. Insane. There was like 16 of them in the whole country at the time. Because, I mean, that, yeah, those, that's two companies that are like direct competitors, right? And I got to sell both of them on the same show. Really nice. <clears throat> so, the problem here is that, that this looking at only the industry kind of makes it so you think, oh, well. Um, if, if I can, if I can pick the right industry, right, I can come in and earn these high rates of return, right, and, <clears throat> and, but, but the way I have to do that is I have to take from another company in that industry, right? I have to have super high barriers so somebody else can't come in and earn these profits, right? Or I have to have, um, you know, very low buyer power, right? So I can just, you know, bam, crank up the prices on those buyers, right? But the idea is that, you know, with this sixth component, right, this cooperation between complements, right, sometimes you actually can sort of improve the industry itself, right? And so this prediction that five forces model would give us, right, that, you know, it's just sort of like you get in and bam, you just rip the profits out of somebody else. That's right? not necessarily how it would always work, right? You could come into an industry and have create a complementary product, right? That would actually help grow the industry. So <clears throat> what I like is a, a little better, because I think it's a little more realistic, is the resource-based view. Um, and, and I'm going to kind of actually just give it my own little um, flip here, actually. So the resource-based view, um, so write V-R-I-O down, like down your paper like this, V-R-I-O. B R I O. The resource base view says you have to, the, the way to be a competitive, successful firm is to create a product that's valuable, right? So it's got to be D, valuable in the eyes of the consumer. Okay? Now, that's not going to give you a sustainable competitive advantage, right? You create a valuable product that people want, you might have a competitive advantage for a while, but then somebody's going to imitate you, right? or somebody's gonna even leapfrog over you, right? Take your idea and improve it, right? So valuable is okay, but it doesn't get you very far, 
right, in terms of creating a sustainable competitive advantage. The next thing is rate. Okay, that's all. Rate. So the point there is you create a product that is difficult to imitate, or excuse me, a, a product that is um, difficult to get to, right? Difficult to get, right? Or difficult to create, right? There's something about your firm, right? That makes this product great, right? The I is <laughs> inimitable, right? Or difficult to imitate, right? So this is where we start getting into something that provides a sustainable competitive advantage, right? So it's valuable, which is kind of like the thing we have to have, right? If it's not valuable, it's not going to give you any kind of competitive advantage even for 10 seconds, right? If it's rare, right? So if it's um, uh, if it's if it's a product that um, you know people haven't seen before or something like that, right? Then that's going to um, give you a little bit more time. But difficult to imitate, that's where we really get a sustainable competitive advantage, right? So you create something that's difficult to reverse engineer, right? Or there's something about your firm that makes, um, you know, some kind of trade secret or something like that, right? You have some kind of secret formula like Coca-Cola, right? Like they have a formula for their drink that nobody knows, right? So like, yeah, tons of people bottle it or whatever, right? You can just get it in a bottle, but it's really hard to figure out what it's made out of, right? And then O is organizational capacity. So this is the one where we really talk about the company itself having the ability to take advantage of this valuable product they've created, right? So this is where we go beyond the product itself and we say that, uh, the, the way the, form, the firm is organized, right? Maybe we have, um, I don't know, what do they talk about? They talk about uh, some of these companies like, um, well, some of these tech companies, right? Where they have like, you know, people can just sort of show up whenever they want, you know, and they have like ping pong tables and crap like that everywhere, right? So maybe that is some kind of an organizational capacity that your organization has that other organizations would have a hard time replicating, right? And so, excuse me, that helps your firm. Um, <clears throat> the, the product you have relies on this organizational culture, right? And other firms would have, uh, have a hard time, um, you know, coming up with the way of doing that. And so I think I'm gonna kill it right there. This is 9.15. Right, 915, I think so. Okay. Well, I guess I ended at the right time. I don't know if that is good or not, but hey Jason, I have your book <laughs> that you paid for. <laughs> this is a story there. Okay, everybody have a good night. I'm gonna go to bed. <laughs>